so, uh, now I've lost my way here. Oh, yes. No, no, optimism. So I sit in Hawaii and I look at all this and I try to contextualize it and, and come out with a, a good story because I think the best story will win. Uh, so if you, can, if, you can, if you can get together the best version of how it should all come out, so shall it be. And I work at this because in the past I've been very, very happy with the results between my interior fantasy and the unfolding of historical development. I mean, I, I wished for LSD, and then it happened, and then I dreamed of the Internet, and then it happened. So I should keep at this. Definitely. Uh, uh, and I, I recently read a very interesting book called A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History by Michael DeLanda. And if you get a chance, you should take a look at this. And he made the point, which caused me to expand his point into this little thing I'm going to tell you now. But his point was that uh, human beings are very involved in the movement of geological material. That as a species, we move rocks around on a very large scale, and of course it's interesting that the early, some of the earliest human structures are the most physically massive and weighty, <coughs> like the Great Pyramids. Uh, so Delanda made this point about our relationship with the, the geograph geological stratigraphy of the Earth, and that cities were a kind of geological extension of the process of crystallization carried on through the intermediation of a biological unit, i.e. intelligent primates who are building these structures. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. I had never considered it before. I'd all, I've talked about virtual reality and I've said that uh, it's nothing new that Ur was a virtual reality and Chattal Huyuk was a virtual reality but done in stucco and fired ceramic and stone and that when the medium is so intractable as stone the epistemic assumptions that get formed about what reality is are very different than if you can build Versailles at the click of a mouse button uh, but nevertheless it's the same but Embedded in my reading of Delanda was, uh, I've been thinking a lot, and I talked to you a lot last year, about artificial intelligences and minds which are not human, minds which are very different from us, intelligence which is very different from us. Uh, you know, while the naive are scanning the stars our appliances have become telepathic. Uh, uh, we, there is a, a very strange kind of intelligence being called into existence by ourselves, strangely enough. And, and this is the connection to Delanda, this artificial <laughs> intelligence which is being called into being by human activity is made of the same materials as Ur and Chattal Hyuk. It's made of ceramics, glasses, and metals. It's that... Uh, so then I took this on board and thought about it. And I've, I've sort of come to some kind of cyberpantheistic Emersonianism, <laughs> uh, which is... Uh, here, I'll give it to you as a headline and then work backwards so that in case I forget what I'm saying, it, it, it won't be lost to, to suffering mankind. The, the Earth's strategy for its own salvation is through machines, is what it is. And human beings are some kind of, uh, we are the deputized 
spouse. We are the bride in this alchemical rarefaction of glasses, ceramics, metals, and, uh, and volatile materials. Apparently, the earth is like some kind of an embryonic uh, or fetal thing. And at the end of its gestation, what has happened is it is ramifying its nervous system is appearing in its developmental, in the unfolding of its morphogenesis. And as we contemplate nanotechnologies and see ourselves working through bacteria and this sort of thing at the engineering level, you have to be blind to not then reflect back upon the fact that in some sense we are already working at that kind of level, at the behest of it is not clear who, because nobody ever asked the question in quite this way before. The answer to who, I think, is, is the earth. And that what lies ahead at the end of the linear tunnel of, of Western subjectivist, positivist, structuralist assumptions that we've been operating, when we hit the end of the tunnel and burst out, into the larger mental space of cosmic evolution, what we are going to find is that we are partners, actors in a cosmic drama that involves the Earth at one polarity and machines at the other polarity as the expression of the will of the Earth toward a kind of self-reflective transcendence that is achieved through machine human biotic symbiosis. And that and this is you know, it won't there'll never be a headline which says this. Some people won't even notice that it's happening. Because these large scale processes can be described by many metaphors at many deaths. But I'm telling you, I I think this is what going on. Uh, the reason I like this story is because um, it's not a story about processes out of control. It's not a story about human guilt. It's not a story full of we must and we should. It's a story which gives honor to every part of the unfolding experience field. In other words, biology, technology, human culture, human traditional values, transcendent human uh, dystopian values. Uh, it's a story of things on course, on time, and under budget. <laughs> and I assume that's how nature really operates. And that we live inside some kind of anxiety producing culture that is uh, a necessary, I don't want to say evil, but a necessary response to conditions of stress. Uh, there are processes which, le you know, uh, waste, uh, nuclear waste buildup, uh, urbanization, land disturbance, there are processes which if allowed to run on indefinitely would wreck the whole system and pitch it into chaos. But <coughs> Confucius said, uh, no tree grows to heaven. And what he meant by that is it's fruitless to project any process to infinity because any process projected to infinity creates some kind of catastrophic scenario. If no fruit flies died in six months, the Earth would spin out of its orbit from the weight of fruit flies. No, I don't think that's <laughs> <laughs> But what an image. <laughs> Somebody once told me if the Earth completely disappeared except from, for its nematodes, that you could still see the outlines of the continents if you were standing on the moon. I thought, now just who gathered this? <laughs> so then, to bring this back around a little, 
where where is the psychedelic experience in in all of this? Well, um, it used to be called, or at one phase, it was called uh, consciousness expansion. And consciousness expansion in human beings is going to become uh, an absolute necessity because we are summoning out of the woodwork of cybernetic technology machines that are going to require super intelligent humans to direct and, uh, and have discourse with them. We, this is happening. It is already happening. I mean, the Internet is this. I mean, it doesn't tap you on the shoulder and remind you to brush your teeth. But it is, you know, a partner in the understanding of the world that is genie-like. That's the image I have when I sit down to it. It is, it is uh, all John D. would have asked of his archangelic messengers, you know. He wanted instantaneous information on the political situation in the courts of Europe. He wanted information on the course of the Drake's expedition then on the other side of the planet. The Internet is this kind of magical, intelligent prosthesis. Uh, and as I said, there won't come a dramatic moment I think, a la lawnmower man or something like that. <laughs> these, these things are, are much more steeping. Uh, the only people who in fact can see the game move against the background of the forest pattern are psychedelic heads. Uh, you have to think about this stuff and you have to develop vocabularies for catching it in action. Uh, this is what the game of of, uh, of being an intellectual is, I think. Uh, trying to trying to see the process of morphological unfoldment in action and guess uh, the direction in which it's uh, it's headed, uh, because it's inevitably headed toward greater density of information at greater speeds, higher level integrated metaphors visually rather than textually displayed, uh, transformation of such graphic and glyphic elements over time, it becomes more and more like the interface <coughs> of a computer, more and more like some kind of uh, machine environment. I mean, our th we have thought for, I assume, at least a hundred thousand years, maybe much uh, longer. But uh, the quality of thought, you know, it was early, when it was early, it was intermittent, it was thin, it was a groping, it was a, an undigested intuition, a perception slipping away from the mind's eye because of media reinforcement and education and acculturation and the passage of a hundred thousand years the voice of the mind, the, the logos, uh, has grown stronger. But now it takes uh, a, uh, an exponential leap forward into visualization, into manifestation through this information processing prosthesis that integrates us all. And, uh, you know, I can imagine a future not very far away where the, the individual, uh, the expression of the individual is lowered, is more muted. I mean, this is the most individualistic, individual worshipping century, the century just ending, that we have ever known. And it's, it's great accomplishments. Uh, it's great works of art were all accomplished by individuals and uh, political undertakings such as the Third Reich and so forth and so on. Also highly motivated individuals who rose above the masses. I'm, I'm not sure we can afford the luxury of that kind of exhibitionistic individualism in the future. And I think probably it's not that we're talking about a restriction of human rights. We're talking about a transformation of human drive. Uh, 
the spirits of integration and collectivity that will be sold as public utilities in the next century are anticipated now by group psychedelic experiences, ayahuasca sections, uh, this sort of thing. And the, the dichotomy, and I, I think I made this clear when I talked about the earth and machines, the dichotomy between the natural and the artificial is an obsession of the 20th century, hence canceled now. Uh, in fact, a whole bunch of things are canceled. We were talking at home about how how uh, Roger Shattuck in his history of Dada said that the 20th century couldn't wait to be born. It was born in 1888 at the death of Victor Hugo. And then I said, well, so if it was born in 1888, when did the 20th century end? And I think it ended in 1992. It expired early with the birth of the World Wide Web. What defined all that, modernity, uh, was mass media. You know, uh, mass media shaped that whole psychology. And it is now archaic. It is now, it's not archaic, it's obsolete. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful that the phrase 20th century is beginning to have that wonderful brown gravy Edwardian tone that used to be reserved for the term 19th century. Meaning, you know, those terribly stuffy and confused and rather silly people who just didn't quite get it right but were doing the best they could and muddling through and thank God they gave way to us, the people of the 21st century.